Hi everyone, and welcome to the next episode of the Bay Street Capital Holdings podcast titled How Did You Do It and Why Should I Care? This series aims to highlight women doing amazing work in various industries. So today we are so lucky to be joined by Louisa Duran, or Wheeze, who's been called many things from a coach, podcast host, advocate, agent of change, strategist and educator, to name but a few. And ultimately, she's a compassionate provocateur that is out to uncover your path of possibility. So thank you so much, Louisa, for being here today. Um, let's start with an introduction. Uh, well, I mean, I feel like you already did it. That was great. We're done, right? <laughs> um, no, thank you. I'm really glad to be here. Um, I know it's always funny, like, even though, like, I and my team, like, wrote that whole intro, I like to really just tell people, like, I, you know, I'm just a regular girl from Oakland who is very fortunate to have known exactly what I wanted to do with my life at like 13. That's great. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is really rare. And, you know, not necessarily that I started doing it the way that I wanted to do it because life gets in the way and, you know, you have to go to university and all the things, but, um, but yeah, I, I knew what I wanted to do very young. I've, I've, uh, been very involved in social justice and anti-racism, anti-oppression work and organizing um, God, for like as long as I had a voice I forget or figured out like <laughs> that I had a voice and like what it could do. My parents can tell you some stories. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, everyone calls me Wheeze. I um, am very fortunate to have grown up in the Bay Area. So I also grew up in an environment and a culture and a community that really embraced social justice and activism and change and really like collective healing and liberation and the importance of community. Um, and so I always have to like say that when I introduce myself because I certainly would not be who I am and where I am if it wasn't, you know, for the intersection of where I grew up and kind of, mm -hmm. you know, the elders and the community members that, that guided me through life. So yeah, that's me. No, absolutely lovely to meet you. And I'd just love to hear what inspired you to sort of get involved with racial justice and equality. Yeah, so I, um, it's interesting. People always ask me that. And I'm like, I literally, I like, I, I was born. Like, I, can't, Fair enough. I, Fair enough. I was like, this is your calling, walk your path. <laughs> um, no, so I have, ooh, where to start? So my parents, um, and most of my family that I know of, uh, and I say that I know of because as most people from the African diaspora know, due to the enslavement uh, and human trafficking of Africans, we have lost much of our ancestry and our history and all the other things. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of my family is actually still in the motherland and um, lived through colonization. Oh, wow. So they were bo born into col colonial Northwest Africa. Mm -hmm. um, I make it a point of not saying the countries, not because I'm not proud of them, but because to name them as countries is to name the continent in a way that was depicted and described and broken up by colonization. So I say the Northwest, um, mm -hmm. but for people that are curious, Algeria, Morocco, and Mauritania. Um, so, you know, uh, much of my family was born into colonial Africa. Um, mm -hmm beyond third class citizens, right? So on top of a history of enslavement and um, very young, you know, I had family that was like, listen, you are going to know the truth. You are going to know the history. You are going to understand the way that power dynamics and colonization and imperialism and white supremacy work. And so I was like in middle school reading France Fanon and like eating wow. it. Exactly. Right. You know, when I tell people that they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, I found a France Fanon book at the library. And my parents were like, uh, you want to read this? And granted, I read it again in college and I'm glad I did because I, you yeah. know, my 13 year old brain didn't grasp all the things. But I tell people that so that they truly grasp, like, this is what I have always been interested in. Mm -hmm. You know, I like, I knew the Panthers 10 point program and like, I, I was a kid running around, like, quoting Malcolm X and like, I was just a very special kid. Um, but you know, again, that being, having been raised really knowing um, history and sociopolitical economic uh, realities, uh, uh, you know, of, of marginalized folks um, really set my foundation. But the catalyst for me was when I was in high school, I realized very quickly 
the ways in which my racial ambiguity and my light light skinness, if you will, right? Like my, my fair skin melanation um, yes. enabled me to navigate spaces in ways that my deeply melanated family, brothers and sisters, you know, like cousins, friends couldn't. And I found myself constantly sitting and seeing and being like, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Why are no adults mm -hmm. saying anything? And then seeing, you know, black and brown folk advocate for themselves and not getting very far. And then I'm like, well, let me like, let me just see, like, if I say a thing, is it going to land differently? Right mm -hmm. now I have yes. a lot of understanding as to why that is, but high school me just knew, oh, so I can say this a little bit more directly or like I can put my body in certain places or I can write, like I can do certain things that, that provides like safety or that like, you know, alerts people to things. And that's yes. all I understood at the time. Um, and once I got that, you know, again, me just having grown up with understanding the way that mm -hmm. it all works, if you will, um, that really kind of, that was it. Like that was the, the light, you know, the, that ignited the fuse. And I've been loud and disruptive since. <laughs> No, I'm glad to hear it. And you know what? I think you were so mature in high school. I, would you count that as down to your parents, like starting you from a very early age? And I'm so glad to hear they told you the stories of your family. Oh, yeah. I um, I mean, even when I was like very, very young, like eight, mm -hmm. nine, ten years old, my parents were just like, like, whose soul is in this kid's body? Like, you've been here before. And, you know, it, because I was like walking around talking to adults, like I had no concept of the fact that I was a child. And I was like, oh, what do you mean? You don't read Paolo Coelho as well? Like, <laughs> right? I'm like reading The Alchemist at 12. Uh, you know, shout out to my parents and like, you know, the community that raised me. Mm -hmm. um, but 100%. It is 1000% attributed to being st like literally as soon as I came out the womb, really understanding, not only understanding the ways in which power dynamics work mm -hmm. in this world, um, and how the how they support infrastructures and so on and so forth, but also having a deep pride in my identity and a love for you know the motherland and my ancestry and no and and learning about it, having the privilege to learn about it outside of the whitewash perspective, right? Having the privilege to learn about the colors and the food and the music and and all of the things that that make you know my culture and my lineage and my ancestry like beautiful. Yeah. And like and celebrated. Yeah. Um, so I was I was also given that. Right. And so for mm -hmm. me, it was like, duh, I'm going to fight for this. <laughs> you know, like I'm, I'm 13 and 14 and I don't really fully get the whole scope. But like this makes sense to me. <laughs> yeah. No, that's so good to hear. And on the sort of line of culture and like books, what did you find um, as the best resources to help you along your journey? Well, the internet came out sometime after I got into high school, <laughs> like right in the beginning. Yeah, I'm yeah. Like, I know I look like a, a small child. Yes, couldn't have guessed. I know, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I drink a lot of water and also shout out to the ancestors and the DNA. Um, but no, I was like in high school when the internet came out. So prior mm -hmm. to that, there um, there's this thing that a lot of you know young folks might not, younger folks might might find foreign, mm -hmm. um, but it's uh, you know oral tradition. <laughs> so oh. literally, like you know, you might have heard of it in school. Uh, I joke about it because now that we have the internet, like I feel like people don't sit down with their elders necessarily anymore. They're like, oh, I'm just gonna Google it. Exactly. Um, right. Yeah. But it's so yeah, my grandma used to tell me stories about when she was coming over from Pakistan and you couldn't find this on the internet because they lived through it, right? Exactly. So literally sitting down mm -hmm. and asking questions and listening to stories. And again, I'm very fortunate to be surrounded by folks that both have stories from, quote unquote, back home, right? And like mm -hmm. lived through it as well as folks that were, you know, do again, to the, the ways in which the African diaspora were just dispersed throughout the globe, right? Mm -hmm. um, in different parts of the world, like being able to say, well, from this perspective, this is all like, this is the rest of your lineage, or this is the rest of the ancestry. And like yeah. being able to sit down and yeah, hear about things like very much like, you know, to, to your point with your grandmother, like, you can't Google that. Exactly. Um, that like there's unless you sit down with someone who's truly lived through it and can tell you their real life lived experience of what it was like, what it felt like, what it smelled like, what you know, what what it meant, all the feelings, 
Yeah. You never really know, you know? Exactly. So, so I, I did a lot of sitting and a lot of listening and a lot. I also remember thought I was a grown up, apparently. So I spent a lot of time with grown ups. And I think it was, you know, beautiful for them too. And like awesome. Cause there was like this kid who actually wanted to like spend time and listen and ask the questions and be like, well, what did it smell like? And what did it feel like? And, and, and just, I couldn't get enough of it. I really couldn't. So um, that is one of the main tools. Um, and then the public library. Yes, the library, often forgot about. Loved it. <laughs> I had a library card very, very early. And I. Oh, oh my goodness, this is unlocking a memory in my brain. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? I'm taking you back. The library card, super early. I still have a library card. Uh, and I would just go and get all the books. I loved to read. Um, part of that I do have to note, because I think it's important for people to understand, is that English is my third language. And so, yeah, you can't really, quote unquote, tell when I speak English. Some folks think maybe I'm just from a different part of the U.S. They hear like the way I say certain words. But um, I had initially gone to French schools because um, the French, it's a whole thing. They gave citizenship to certain colonies and not others. But if you did and you lived outside of France, they really wanted to make sure that you learned French and knew the French education system and were a good patriot. So they paid for your school. Oh, that's so interesting. I didn't know that. Yep. So my parents, obviously not having a lot of money, um, mm -hmm. were like, oh, if we send you to French school, the French government will pay for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Makes Which sense. is also why they made sure to let me know the truth, quote unquote, <laughs> of like colonization, <laughs> imperialism and all the other things. Because they're like, okay, you're going to go to a French school, but let us tell you what really happened. Yes. That's important. It really works. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, I ended up reading a lot because I ended up transferring to an American school. Mm -hmm. And I went from being, quote unquote, top of the class, very bright, really intelligent, high marks all the time, to transitioning to an American school where even the way that they divide and do math is different. Mm -hmm. And being told I'm not smart and I can't keep up. And this at the other one really wasn't that. I'm <laughs> actually brilliant. There was a language barrier because I had mm -hmm. never had to do school in English. Also, the English language does not follow basic grammatical rules and structure. So <laughs> that being said, um, I actually ended up like I fell in love with reading in books because it was my it allowed my brain to really start to practice English. Mm -hmm. Um, in a way that allowed me to start to excel in the classroom because I needed, it was just the need to practice the language. Mm -hmm. And so it was twofold, but I was reading the things I wanted to read for a very petty, spiteful reason as a child. I was like, oh, you don't think I'm smart? Watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, right. But so, so I spent a lot of time in the library and a lot of time with books, mm -hmm. um, reading history, reading, um, you know, autobiographies, uh, any anything I could get my hands on, really. Mm. Um, and I would just drink it up. No, that's so good to hear. Like you were consuming that media from a very young age. So yeah, definitely raised well in that sense. <laughs> Shout out to my parents. They did something. I, 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 I was going to say they did something right, but they've done a lot of right things. That's not fair. <laughs> No, no, completely fair. Um, so you mentioned from a young age, you obviously found your voice, but I guess, are there any lessons that you wish you would have learned um, before, you know, pursuing this path in your life? Oh, my God. I don't know if we have time. <laughs> so I, two, there's two big lessons. Like if I could go back and tell younger me, mm -hmm. um, the first is when you know exactly what you want to do, when you truly have like a fire and a passion and a burning inside of you to do a thing, right? Whether that's being an anti-racism, decolonial, you know, disruptor and educator, actor, writer, architect, I don't care what it is. Mm -hmm. Like when you know that you want to do a thing, don't let anybody tell you that you can't. It's so cliche, but it is so true. Mm -hmm. Don't let anybody stand in the way of the thing that you love. And, and the purpose that you know you found in yourself. Mm -hmm. um, we sometimes let those voices get really loud. And then all we do is end up fighting ourselves. I spent a lot of time like dancing around what I'm doing now. So it was like, okay, okay, yeah, I'm not going to do that. So like, I'm going to like work in a nonprofit. I'm going to work in education. And I actually started in music and sports. But even in then it was like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm going to do like, you know, athlete advocacy and development. Like, 
girl, no, just go do, do the thing, right? Like I spent so much time still doing things I loved, mm -hmm. but it was all because the one, my purpose, my one true calling, my path, right? That to me was so clear and illuminated. Mm -hmm. All I heard from everyone was, can you even make a job out of that? No one's going to take you seriously. Or from, you know, my family, black and brown folks that were concerned is like, is that safe? Mm -hmm. Right? Like there's a true safety concern here. Yeah. If it doesn't work out, are you ever going to be hireable? Because look at who does hiring in corporate America. True. But then how did you find that courage, I guess, to pursue it? Yeah. So um, I, very long story short, married and divorced. The, the, my ex-husband is from St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And uh, so nieces, nephew, family from St. Louis. And we had been living in St. Louis at the time that Michael Ferguson was murdered. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, Michael Brown was murdered in Ferguson. Okay. And um, we were so living there uh, at the intersection of having already worked with youth right, that were so deeply impacted by the pain that that knew Michael Brown and um, were protesting and needed the safe spaces and so on and so forth. Had a lot of my own network from California, right? Oakland born and raised, went to Berkeley. So like Berkeley alumni, different organizations from California that were also coming out mm -hmm. and providing support and help and organizing. And so over that time, I had like, I found some like cute little nine to five, like that I was like, overqualified for. Why do you want this job? Obviously, I wasn't going to tell them so that I can be in these streets and like do the thing and protest and not care about getting fired or whatever. Um, but I went and like found like a cute little nine to five, literally working at a spa. Like people are like, you were working at a spa? Yes, because it's by any means necessary. That's what Malcolm yeah. X said, right? Like yeah. I just need to pay bills. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like to do this work. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really found myself like, to me, it was one of those life moments where it's like, this is what you're supposed to be doing, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people think the work is like either being on the front lines or like being in the protest or whatever. But sometimes the work is having your house be a safe place for mm -hmm. kids who just need somewhere to go because they've been protesting or, mm -hmm. you know, feeding feeding the, those kids, right? Giving those kids rides, like making yourself accessible to them in those ways. Like it really does take a lot of different roles, you know? Um, and so for me, it was like, I just kind of like jumped into it and then was like, oh, that's cause this, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Right. And you just felt um, right in that moment. Oh yeah. That's so good. So it was, it was, yeah. It was like coming home to myself, Oh, that's, you know? Yeah. Um, and then oddly enough, I was like, oh, look, I have degrees in sociology, education, ethnic studies, like all these other things. Remember how everyone said, see, this is that moment of don't listen to people. Remember how everyone said I was getting these degrees that were a waste? Mm -hmm. What was I going to do with them? <laughs> uh, look at me using them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Why are you studying behavioral science? Oh, look. <laughs> look at me. I built a whole business around it. Um, but no, so... So that was, that was the moment that changed it for me. And then after that, it was, it was hard. You know, mm -hmm. I knew good and well, I couldn't work in these nonprofits that were still very white saviory and had white corporate boards. And they all had the perception of equity without the integrity of actionability. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I have to, I have to start my own business. Like I have to do this by myself on my own terms. I'm not here to placate whiteness. I am not here to, you know, I basically, my whole ethos is decenter whiteness support and honor everyone's humanity across the board, but mm -hmm. do it in a way that honors and supports those closest to the pain and disrupts our status quo. Mm -hmm. you, you don't stay hired very long doing that, let me tell you. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> Even if you're quote unquote professional, right? Mm -hmm. Serving whiteness, like whatever it is. No, no. Your girl was not keeping jobs for that reason. Even if it was in DEI. Yeah. Oh, really? That's actually interesting. Well, think about who who's writing checks, white corporations, white mm -hmm. folks. So if you go into a DEI training and you tell the CEO of a company that he is not allowed the space to speak in this moment, because the thing that came out of his mouth was deeply harmful mm -hmm. and through the process of restorative justice, it means that he actually has to just sit and listen. And his, you know, subordinate, he's the CEO, his subordinate, who's like a, a, an administrative assistant, who, you know, is a black queer person gets to actually have the space and is going to be prioritized so that they can name how they were harmed and what they want in that restoration process. Yeah. 
that that person is going to do it because they want to look professional during the training, but then they're going to go snitch to your company. Mm. Right. Yeah. Stay hired very long because a lot of these, this is why I say I don't do DEI work. DEI work is a bandaid on a gunshot wound. DEI work makes it look really nice, Mm -hmm. but we're not taking actual care of the problem, right? There's no surgery involved. There's no aftercare. We're just like, oh, you're bleeding out from a gunshot wound to the abdomen. Here's a Band-Aid. Enjoy. That's what DEI is. And that's Mm -hmm. why like, I couldn't, I couldn't stay. Mm -hmm. And I kept like, well, I tell you how many times I got called into offices. So we had a complaint. Let me guess. Some white person got their feelings hurt because I told them that for two seconds, they had to actually listen to the impact of their actions and their behavior. Mm-hmm. Fuck out of here. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> okay. but that's I'm like, get out of here. Yeah. Like, you're not, you know, like, why are we really doing this work? Exactly. So I, said, I started my own business. And when I did, every, that, you know, that was everyone's thing is like, are you going to make money? And are you going to do this? And how are you going to do this? And is this a concern? And who's going to hire you? And I, you know, for me, it was like, does it matter? Does yeah. it matter? As long as I can pay my bills and eat, I'm truly doing something that I fundamentally like believe I've been put on this earth to do. Okay. Yeah. Right? It's the passion that's driving you, I would say. Yeah. I mean, beyond that, I think it's also truly my, like, I don't think that I would be living a values aligned life if I didn't. I truly believe that every single human being on this planet deserves their humanity and deserves the full human experience. They get mm-hmm. joy and pain and pleasure and happiness and sadness and anger and whatever it is that they want to experience without being valued or denied any opportunity or accessibility, period, Mm. period, regardless of your identity. That should just be the basic, you know, but I know. It should be. Exactly. (laughs) The bare minimum, if anything. (laughs) So, so yeah, I, I, uh, I really am living out that, that dream. So, but to answer your initial question, so that's the one, the other, (laughs) The other uh, thing that I would tell myself is um, make sure that your voice is the loudest voice. And I don't mean that in terms of like, don't listen to haters or whatever, whatever. But like, we've been taught not to essentially allow ourselves and our spirits and and what we we know to be true to be our North Stars. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we might make concessions or we might not, you know, say the thing like we want to say it or go as hard or this at the other yeah. because we'll doubt we doubt ourselves. Yeah. Um, and that, that's probably the other lesson that I've learned is that every time I've doubted myself, like I've been my own doubter, right? Like I'm like, no, 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 no. Shh, quiet, turn yourself down. Um, and I, I, you know, did things in different ways or whatever. Um, I always ended up, there was always some sort of like mess or struggle or stress. And then when I went back to like original option, if I had just done it, like if I had followed my own North star from the beginning, yeah, you know, like everything would have been smoother. And then, yeah, not everyone's going to like you. That's- Most people don't like me and that's fine. Right. Like <laughs> look at what I talk about all day long publicly. I don't mm-hmm. care. But the people, but, but that's the point is like, I'm so unfazed because I'm so authentic to myself and what I know to be true that I'm like, Okay, that sounds like a you problem. Yeah, and it's such a it's such a relevant message no matter what industry you're in because no not everyone's gonna like you and you've just got to accept that fact and just be comfortable in yourself. Yeah, hundred percent. Oh well, that's so interesting that you started your own business though because you couldn't find your own. So I guess um, you must have faced challenges or setbacks. What what would you say is the biggest failure in your career or anything you can think of? So I have an unpopular view of failure, I think. Um, I don't believe that I've ever failed. No, I think that's very valid. I think seeing it as not a failure is the first step. Yeah, yeah. So, but it's interesting. I tell tell people that and they're like, oh, so you've always done it right? And I'm like, no, no, no. (laughs) Let's be clear. I have messed, quote unquote, messed up a lot of things. I've taken a lot of steps back. I've held a lot of L's. Yeah. (laughs) But I've never failed because I never quit. Everything mm-hmm. was always an opportunity for me to grow and to learn and to be a better version of myself and a business owner and an educator and a human than I was before the thing happened. Mm-hmm. Um, what I will say is the 
big quote unquote biggest L's that I take are um, ones that at this point, I'm just like, whatever, I literally don't care. Um, it's the nature of my work. So most of my work is focused on actually liberating melanated folks. So yes. I do a lot of work around like w within black and brown, indigenous, API, um, melanated communities around our own liberation, right? Whether it's understanding financial literacy or decolonizing our mindsets, whatever the thing is, right? Like how do we liberate ourselves? Cause no yeah. one's coming to save us, but us. Yeah. And then on, adjacent to that, I do hold courses and programs and so on and so forth and do, you know, consulting for either white centered organizations or homogenous white groups. Yeah. And without fail, and we saw this post Great White Awakening, which is what I call the last year, um, the, because it was the Great White Awakening, all of a sudden a whole bunch of white folks were like, oh, racism is real. Hola. Hi, and welcome. Welcome to the <laughs> um, I'm glad you're here. Don't do it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they all woke up at the same time. Cool, cool, cool. Um, there's always an, an ebb and a flow. Yeah. And so what happens is a whole bunch of white folks will wake up, quote unquote, right? They get woke. It's like new, cute, cool term everyone should stop saying, actually. Um, they invest in the work. They want to sign up for things. They, right, like you're the hottest thing on the streets. And then the moment's passed or they realize it's actually really hard to dismantle your internalized whiteness and reconcile your relationship with a, you know, white supremacist racist society. Mm. And it, it, it's just not as convenient anymore. Mm. Or maybe we're not posting black squares and so there's no need to perform. And so they completely abandon the work. Yeah. And so my initial quote unquote L's were again, uh, not listening to my North star because I've been doing this work a long time. Right. Yeah. In various ways. I also have the degrees and the background in social behavioral sciences. So I know how it works, right? Yeah. Intellectually, I know how it works. I know that this is going to happen. I know what happens when you challenge and confront, right? Your programming and socialization and all those things. Mm -hmm. I, because I hoped that that wouldn't be the case, I put myself in very bad financial decisions, quote unquote, because I expected people to keep through with their commitments. I expected whiteness to not get in the way. Yeah. And so there were moments where I'm like, oh, cool. Like the business is stable. I'm doing well. And then all of a sudden it's like, uh, where, where, do, where'd everyone go? What? Wait, I don't, why don't I have any money? <laughs> like, okay. Well, so I had to learn that lesson a couple, a couple of times mm -hmm. before I started to ch have to like change my business models, uh, change my payment structures. Right. So like, for me, I had the, the, thank God the answer was structural change yeah. uh, as well as expectational, yeah, expectation. I changed my own expectations of mm -hmm. things. Um, but, but the, yeah, that, that was that, yeah. Fair enough. And it's not even a failure. It's just somewhere where you learn from it and you just kept getting better, I guess. Well, it feels kind of like a failure when you're like, oh shit where's my money? And then you're, cause you like, didn't, you know, yeah, it's not really a failure, but it, it, it takes more out of your control, I would say as well. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's actually just a generally, that's the best answer I can give you because I look at everything, even like, this is a personal thing, but like even my divorce, I'm mm -hmm. like, it was amicable. So I'm like, I look at that as like, look at how much I learned. Exactly. Like I'm, I'm like going to be a better partner and a better future wife and like all these things. And I'm a better version of me. And people are like, huh, that's, and I'm like, oh, this is how I navigate life. So I don't ever look at it as I'm like, I just have a, had a lot of learning moments. No, that's good. Life is all about learning, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think so, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the stage is yours, I guess, for this question. But what is one common myth about your profession that you want to debunk? Like right here, right now. Yeah, that we all hate white people and we're angry. <laughs> like, my best friend is white. Well, <laughs> one of them. But no, like, um, for those that are listening and don't know that was a joke, you can't use people <laughs> to say that you either like or don't like or are racist or not racist. I had to clarify that because I'm like, people might listening might not have understood the joke of like, oh. you know, like my best friend is black. And you're like, okay, that's nice. You still said a racist thing. Um, yeah, no. So that is probably the biggest thing. 
everybody assumes I must hate white people and I'm angry all the time. And I'm like, okay, I'm angry sometimes because the world is on fire yeah, and, it, and it makes me angry. And if you're not angry, I would like to check in around why you're not angry because there's at least one thing in the world right now that should be making you angry, whether it's the climate or the panty or racism or bigotry or transphobia or xenophobia. It's something, something, the fact that we have to pay for healthcare and it's astronomical and we still can't have access to it. Like something should make you mad, right? Yeah. So that is justifiable. But yeah, there's this common misconception that like, because I'm constantly addressing white supremacy or because I'm constantly addressing, because I do anti-oppression work as a whole because everything is born out of white supremacy. So I'm addressing some version of an ism as I call it. So whether it's xenophobia, transphobia, you know, anti-blackness, you know, whatever the thing is, people assume that I just like hate mainstream identities. Like that's such an interesting point of view. You would be surprised though. Like the common assumption is you must hate white folks or you must hate men because you talk about female liberation or you must hate cis folks because you talk about transphobia. And I'm like, no, or how about I love all people, including the ones that y'all, the system disenfranchises, which is why I do this work, right? It's really hard for people to separate the cis systemic and infrastructural realities and the ways in which we've been socialized to play into them yeah human beings themselves and so i get that so like a lot of times this is why people with mainstream identities when we say like you know pay the pay down with the patriarchy and men or cis men are like you hate us and i'm like no i i actually don't like i love men like beautiful creature well when they're not feeding the patriarchy those ones beautiful creatures right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can criticize the patriarchy without criticizing the identity that benefits from it, right? Or without hating the identity that benefits from it. Most people can't wrap their head around that. Yeah. Hmm. So yeah. That, that interesting? interesting, for sure. And I guess sort of like, how do you get over those um, stereotypes that people put against you? Like, do you make sure to inform them or do you just accept it, I guess? Yeah, I just, at this point, I'm just like, that's not, I, I don't know where you got that idea from. Okay. Like I'm so unfazed. I think again, because I've been doing this so long. Yeah. I've heard, listen, I've been called a cult leader. I've been, oh yeah. The things that people say. And also because the internet is free and everybody gets to have an opinion on the internet. Mm. But I'm so unfazed at this point. So all I ever do is just ask questions. Interesting. Why would you think that? Mm. Oh, huh. What is it about what I just said or did that made you feel like that? Tell me more. And then typically people are like, uh, but I don't, uh, uh. right. Yeah. I'll let you sit with that. Enjoy. I just, I'm, I just, I can't. No, I love that attitude. Huh? No, I love that attitude. It's honestly a good attitude to have. Yeah. Otherwise I wouldn't make it, honestly. Mm -hmm. I would just, there's, there's so much constantly being thrown at us that the, uh, the, those of us that do this type of work, whether it's, you know, individuals that are leading protests, like, you know, shout out to Mika Mallory, who's currently having people say horrible things about her, you know, mm -hmm. or um, those of us that aid in protest or educate or are leading organizations, like whatever the thing is, right? If you are in a position where you are challenging status quo and mainstream identity and privilege, mm -hmm. society has been built to insulate and protect those that that same mainstream identity and those same privileges, mm -hmm. right? And so sometimes it even comes from folks that you wouldn't expect. They always say not all skin folk are kin folk, right? Um, and, but yeah, you just you can't take it to heart. You can't listen to it. You, I'm just like, where did you learn that? What what about the exchange that just happened? left you thinking that that was the case. Like I just asked tons of questions and I flip it back on people because it's never about me. It's a projection of how they understand the world and how they've been socialized to navigate the world. Mm. So I'm like, that's between you and whoever raised you. Enjoy. I love it. Yeah, that's good. Um, I guess we can move on to some more general questions just about you. So um, what have you read or listened to recently that's really inspired you? Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, I'm like, 
So I'm I'm kind of the worst. Remember how I said books are my thing? Yeah. <laughs> I'm reading, I read like five books at a time. Oh, wow. It's just the way that my brain works. Like some mm -hmm. of them are like very academic. Some of them will be like, you know, a total fiction story. Like I just, I'll need like a palate cleanser, but like I like stay in it. Um, mm -hmm. Oddly enough, actually, uh, Paulo Coelho is one of my favorite authors. Yeah. He wrote The Alchemist. That's his mm -hmm. most famous book. Um, and so I say oddly enough, cause it has nothing to do with the work that I do. Um, but I am working through all, like one of my bucket list things is I want to read every book he's ever written. Oh, wow. And yeah. I, I love books. <laughs> I've had a lot of books. Yeah. I think he's at like 70 something, maybe. I don't know. He's written a lot of books. It's a lot of books. Yeah. It's a lot of books, but he wrote a book called the pilgrimage. And he actually has a new book out too. I gotta go get. But anyways, um, and and for me, his, the Alchemist is the first book of his he read. I read it in middle school, and I actually read it every few years. And for people who have read the Alchemist, have you read the Alchemist? I haven't actually. Oh my god! Everyone should read this book. I give it to like everybody who's never read it as a birthday present. Once I find out they haven't read it, um, because it's a it's a it, it is a story, right? It's it's fiction well it's quasi-fiction um but it's a human story it's a story about experience it's a story about coming home to yourself it's a story about listening to yourself it's a story about listening to whatever your life belief system is we'll call it the universe right the signs mm -hmm. we all have guides um, i'm a very like spiritual person i believe in like and you know ancestral healing and connection and and listening to earth and all of those things um and the pilgrimage is kind of like an extension of of that book mm -hmm. And so for where I'm at in my life right now and uh, the ways in which this last year has taken its toll on truly like on me and my body and, you know, mental health and all the other things, because um, anti-racist educators have been at the forefront of everything yeah. for almost a year um, now, um, that book has inspired me to reconnect to the ways in which I need to protect my peace and really focus on like my calling and my path um, and my purpose mm -hmm. in a way that I had almost not lost, but lost sight of in the last, in the last few months. Cause sometimes you like get into what you do so much that you forget your why. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I would say that that book, right. Like is the thing that I would say is most impacted me most recently yeah. i mean i'll definitely make sure to pick up that book but i completely resonate with what you said about this past year it's been hard on everybody oh yeah yeah oh yeah and there was a pandemic happening too see that's how much like i'm like what is what is time like what is what is more oh, like you just had this pandemic but also something you're really passionate about like the race the race yeah. tensions as well it just added yeah. stress during such a stressful yeah. moment yeah yeah, yeah. I like legitimately almost forgot we were in a pandemic because I was just thinking about the impact of like the work. But yeah, mm -hmm. also being in a pandemic and, you know, I'm in California. So we've been on virtual lockdown. Like we had moments where it opened back up a little bit, but we've essentially been locked down since last March. Like we're just now opening back up. So a lot of other places in the country have like either never locked down or maybe yeah. locked down for a little bit, sheltered in place for a little bit. Mm -mm. The Bay Area has been super strict. Oh my goodness. Like our restaurants just started opening up for outdoor dining. We haven't been able to do anything. Oh yeah. People goodness. don't really realize that we've had it like real bad here. Oh my gosh. It's so easy to forget because I remember at the start of the pandemic, um, obviously California was the first to close down and I didn't even realize you guys never opened up. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, you're going strong and things are opening up and the vaccine's out. So hopefully oh, that. Can get God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess my final question then to you would be sort of who are three people in your life who have been the most influential to you? I hate this question. I hate when people ask me this. <laughs> it's a great question. It's just so hard for me. I'm the type of person that like has taken something from everybody that I've ever had the honor of like exchanging with. Um, so I have like mentors and then I have like family members and then I have like people in history and I'm like I can never answer this question I've been sitting with this question all day and I'm like I don't, <sighs> I don't okay I won't stress you out but maybe I know it's so stressful. Let's go generally let's say 
the elders in my family. Yeah. So aunts, uncles, godmother, parents, grandparents who truly, truly experienced um, the brunt of what I'm working to dismantle in mm -hmm. ways that, you know, obviously their ancestors, uh, older, you know, folks before them even had it worse off, um, but maintained their joy and their love and their humanity and um, were able to pass down both the the truth of this world and again, the joy and the humanity and the love and all the things that I also received from them. Yeah. Um, so I'll just make them a whole, they're one, one whole collective. Yeah. 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 Um, that's one. I, I will say uh, my mentor from college, um, his name is John Payton, but we call him Kwame Superstar Allah. Uh, that's his rap name. And I will not like, he will forever be stuck with it because he rapped when he was much younger. So. Oh, that's actually awesome. That is so cool. Yeah. So he was a Cal alumni who went back to Cal and was an academic advisor and counselor and teacher. And so my freshman year in Cal was at Cal was his first year going back and teaching. Wow. And yeah, and um, I will say that Kwame impacted and probably saved me in ways that I didn't even know that I needed somebody to be there for and save me, you know, and like mm -hmm. he taught me lessons that I didn't even know I had needed until like later on in life. Mm -hmm. um, and like beautiful full circle, his very last class that he just taught last semester, I co-taught, co-lectured with him at Berkeley, like he brought me to teach with him. Um, so that is one specific person. Um, love him dearly. Uh, he's still here in the in the Bay now that the pandemic is, oh, now we're opening up and like, we'll be able to grab coffee hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, the third person I will say are again, all of the, I'm gonna say all of the black women and femmes um, and non-binary folks who have been so tirelessly carrying globally carrying humanity, society, liberation, and communities on their backs, um, both the pain and the joy um, since the inception of imperialism and colonization, um, because I truly believe that all I am doing is picking up the baton for the ancestors that have moved that baton before me. Um, and you know, I'll say black and brown folks, because there are so many amazing women of all, you know, melanations that that have carried that weight. So that's a that's that's a misspeak on my part to not to not be mindful of that. Um, all of all of those folks that have done it done it before me that have put me in a position to be able to be louder and bolder and more vocal and more disruptive in a safer way than than um, I would have been able to had they not done the work that they had done. So. That is truly amazing. And thank you so much for sharing that. Well, but yeah, I guess we're wrapping up on our time now, but thank you so, so much, Weez, for talking to me today. It was truly humbling to speak with you. Um, make sure to check out Weez on her website and also on her Instagram at According to Weez. But thank you again so much for joining me.